Happy Sabbath, uh, church family, <laughs> and those that might be watching uh, that don't normally come to our church, we welcome you. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the church currently has uh, not a single person in it except for Eric White, who is the uh, guy who's been helping us out with the video and uh, the media. Uh, but I am confident, nonetheless, that God has filled this room with holy angels. I'm confident that when I'm preaching, I'm not preaching by myself, but we have people in this room, angels who are in this room, people who are watching online, and I'm super excited uh, for the message that we have today. Uh, for those that um, don't know, we've been going over a series, and the series is uh, The Significance of Doctrine. And a lot of times what happens with doctrine is we can get lost in the idea that a doctrine is distant from us or that it's just something that is just something that we keep in our head. Uh, it's a good idea. It's a thought. It's a concept. Uh, but in reality, I believe that in every single doctrine, uh, God wants to relate that doctrine with something that we're dealing with in the current present moment. And the doctrine that I'm covering today is state of the dead. Uh, what happens when we die and how is that significant to us in this present moment? How can that help us in this present moment? And it's funny because when I was thinking about the state of the dead, uh, I was thinking to myself, God, in, in this time, in this season, uh, I, I, I want to preach a message that is like hope and that is like, you know, uh, like there's disease in the world, there's sicknesses out there. I, I want to preach a hope message to them. And it's almost like God hit me over the head and it's like, yo, Samson, when it comes to uh, the doctrine of the state of the dead, there's a significance in that that can help people with whatever they're dealing with. Like there's a significance in this doctrine that can help us when we're dealing with issues in our family when we're dealing with issues in our homes, when we're dealing with issues in our communities, when we're dealing issue, with issues at our work, there's, there, there's, there's constantly issues that we're facing. And the, I believe that what God has shown me in the scriptures when it comes to the state of the dead or when it comes to uh, this, 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 this reality of this doctrine having an influence in our life, it, it's beautiful and we're going to see it. And if you stay with me, uh, I want to take us through four uh, questions just to refresh our memory when it comes to the state of the dead. And then after that, I want to cover three passages that lead up to the main point of what I believe is the significance of the state of the dead is. I, I, know, I, know, I know that you're... Uh, that you're at home, but if you can, if you, if you're excited about this and if you're ready for this, I just want to, I just want you to say a hearty amen, whether it's to the person next to you or whether you're sitting by yourself watching this. I want you to say a hearty amen, amen. We're about to jump into this passage. Uh, I hope you're ready. I'm excited, and I hope that you're excited. Uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank you because uh, when it comes to the significance of the state of the dead, I believe that you've dropped in there principles that we can apply to our life. Uh, uh, there's a significance that we can apply to our life that will give us joy, that will give us peace, that will give us understanding, that will give us Thou give us wisdom, and I just want to pray and ask that as we dive into your word, that you may speak, that you may encourage, that you may strengthen, that whatever it is that we're going through in this life, whatever anxieties we might be facing, whatever fears we might be facing, I pray that the state of the dead, this reality of what happens to us when we die, may be something that we keep in our minds, that we keep in our back pockets, that we never forget, and that we may know without a shadow of a doubt that truly you are watching over and you are caring for us us, Father. Lord, I thank you, and we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So like I said, uh, we want to go through four questions, and the first question that we want to ask ourselves uh, in, in, in covering this idea of the state of the dead is, what makes life? Before we can understand what produces life, we have to know what actually makes life. So I, I encourage you to uh, turn with me in your Bibles or in your phones or uh, wherever you're at to Genesis chapter 2, verses 7. And we're going to see exactly what creates life. That's Genesis chapter 2, verses 7. And it says here in the Word, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living 
being. In many translations, it says a living soul. So the two components that we have that create or, or, or make a living soul is you, you have the dust of the ground, which the Lord God formed, and he created, and he carved, and he made. Uh, and I can imagine the first man he made looked, looked gorgeous, looked beautiful. He was creating him with his very own hands. And then after that, uh, uh, he breathes into him the breath of life breathes into man the breath of life, and there you have a living soul. So when you're thinking about the components of a living soul or a living being, you have the dust of the ground or or, 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 or the the, the body, and then you have connected to that uh, uh, the breath that God breathed into him, and you have a living soul. The next question that we want to ask ourselves is, then how is death form, or what brought death, or what brings death? And, And we know that if the body plus the breath equals life, then we know that the, the body minus the breath equals death. But I want to go into exactly why it came about. And if you turn with me in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4, we're going to see what exactly brings about death. Ezekiel I'm not going to lie to you, it's kind of awkward turning to, it's turning to pages with no one in the room. But, but, but nonetheless, I know the holy angels are in here screaming, excited, ready. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And he continues with this phrase, The soul that sins, he shall die. The soul who sins shall die. I, I, I want us to keep in mind uh, uh, that when you're thinking about the concept of a soul, uh, when the soul sins, the soul dies. Uh, in, in, in Genesis, when we see what God said uh, to Adam, that if he eats of this tree, if he disobeys, if he sins, he shall surely die, right? And that leads us to our third question. Well, isn't a soul immortal? Remember, remember, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that uh, when you have the body plus the breath, you have a living soul. So is that living soul then immortal? And God was clear. He says, he says the, the, the soul that sinneth shall die. He, the soul that sinneth shall reverse in the process. But just so we know this uh, uh, from the Bible, I just want us to see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at a couple verses here in 1 Timothy, and we're going to see exactly in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading in verse 17. And we're going to be reading uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 17, but we'll also be reading 1 Timothy chapter 6. But let's read verse 17 first, and it says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And I want us to key in on a, on a phrase. It says, Now to the King eternal, the King who is immortal, invisible to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever. The first thing that we need to know is, 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 is Christ is the one who is eternal. God is the one who is eternal. And as we read in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to get a little bit more clarification. 1 Timothy chapter 6, just turn, turn over a page and reading verse 15 and 16, it says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and the only Potent, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality? Who alone has what? Who alone has immortality? So when you're thinking about Christ, he is the only one who is immortal. He's the only one who has immortality. And then it continues on, who alone has immortality, dwelling in the approachable light, dwelling in, in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So, so, so when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about uh, immortality, is the soul immortal? We come to realize in these few passages that it's Christ alone who is immortal, who is immortal. And it's Christ alone who has immortality in his hands, 
right? It's Christ alone who has immortality in his hands. So he is the only one who can give immortality. He's the only one that can, that who can give mortality. No one else can give immortality. It is Christ alone who gives immortality. And the next question we have to ask ourselves is, so is there any consciousness in death? Or when we do die, is there, is there, is there any consciousness? What, what then happens if, if the process is only just reversed? Uh, what does that leave us? And I want us to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're going to be reading in verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, reading in verse 5. And it says, for the living know that they will die. So the people up here living, us, we, we know that we're going to die. But the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward for their memory of them is forgotten. So when you're thinking about the state of the dead, uh, think about it in the concept of of, of there's nothing. They're not thinking anything. They're not imagining anything. They're not creating anything. They're not walking around. They're not living. They're not up in heaven. They're not over in hell. They're, they're, They're just, they're just. And, and I love the way that Jesus puts it. Uh, it it's, it's like a sleep, right? And, and, and we see that when we're seeing in the story of, of Lazarus, in which, uh, a message in which I spoke a while back, where we're talking about how uh, Lazarus uh, was dead, and, and, and Jesus had to plainly say to them. At first, he was all like, look, Lazarus is sleeping. But then after that, he was like, okay, y'all not getting it. Lazarus is dead. And that's the, that's the relationship that he has. But an, another verse that I want us to read is in Psalms chapter 155, just to, uh, just to give us a more uh, scriptural understanding. In Psalms chapter 155, verses 17, um, we see another verse that shows us. Actually, I think it's 115, because I was like, wait, there's no 155. Is there 155? Give me a second. Yeah, I think it's 115. Psalms chapter 115, reading of verse 17, and it says uh, in Psalms chapter 115, uh, reading of verse 17, it says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So, so, so when you're thinking it like, oh, the people who die, they don't praise the Lord. The people who die, uh, they're asleep. The people who will die are at rest. The people who are die are sleeping. And I think that's, that, that's, that's a beautiful understanding to have as we go into the next three passages to draw our three main points or to draw the, the main point from. Uh, I want to take us to Luke. And because a lot of people have questions when it comes to the story uh, of the thief on the cross, I want us to take us to the book of Luke to understand and see exactly what's happening. It's Luke chapter 23, and it's reading in verse 42 and 43. Luke chapter 23, reading in verses 42 and 43. And this is the scene uh, of, of, of the thief on the cross once again. And uh, the situation that's at hand is one man is saying, hey, look, if you're truly God, why don't you just save us? And then the other guy is looking at him like, yo, man, don't you see that this man doesn't deserve this, but we do? And then he turns to, he turns to Jesus, and this is what he says to him in verse 42. He says, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is the beautiful words of Jesus. It says, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And a lot of times what takes place is a lot of people think what's, what Jesus is saying here is like, yo, thief on the cross, listen, man, because of your faith in me, uh, you today, you're going to be in paradise today with me. But we know this isn't what Jesus is saying because the, one of the first questions we can ask ourselves is, was Jesus in paradise that day? And we know Jesus wasn't, right? We know that Jesus uh, wasn't, especially after when he resurrected. Uh, he says, yo, 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 don't touch me. I haven't gone to my father yet, right? And so as we're, as we're digging into this story and as we're reading and seeing what's taking place, uh, I think one of the beautiful things uh, about Scripture is— um, is the, 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 the practical principles that we can draw from this. And the first one I want to share with you is 
is uh, death is a present promise of a future paradise. Death is, is a present promise of a future paradise, right? So, so when we're thinking, when thinking about what Jesus says to the thief on the cross, we know that he's saying, look, I'm telling you today. Listen, I'm, we're having this conversation today. I'm making this promise with you today that in the future, that when, we come, when, when you rise again, right, when I come back to resurrect you, we are going to be in paradise together. It's a present promise of a future paradise paradise. And this is something that is beautiful, and I, I think it's something that relates to our situations, because God has made promises to us today. He's made promises to us today in his word. And those, those promises that are in his word are for a future paradise. They're for a future fulfillment. And our job today is to cling on to that present promise. Right? So that's the first point that I want to share with you. The first point is death is a present promise of a future paradise. The next uh, a passage that I encourage us to turn to is in 1 Samuel. And this is another scene that people kind of take and mess with uh, when it comes to uh, the state of the dead. Uh, but we can actually both fix that and also draw some uh, practical uh, principles that we can apply to our lives. So it's in 1 Samuel, and it's in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28, and it's reading verses uh, 3 through 11, but I'm just going to highlight some points in these verses, so just follow along. Uh, and this is the scene uh, of, Sam, uh, of uh, Saul going to the witch in order to, to, to try to connect with Samuel again. And it says this uh, in verse 3, it clarifies, it says, Now Samuel had died. And this is something we already understand. What is death? Death is a present promise of a future paradise. Death is the reversal of life. Death is just returning back to dust. Death is the removal of that breath of life, right? So then we continue and it says, Now Samuel had died. It says in verse 3, dumping down to verse 4, and, and, and coming down to verse 4, it says, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped uh, at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. And this is, this is the key right here. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, right? So Saul's looking out to this army of the Philistines. When he looked out to the army of Philistines, he was afraid. And his heart trembled greatly. So I can imagine how scared this man was, right? And listen to what ha takes place, right? After he gets scared, he, he, it says in verse 6, it says, and when, Samuel or it says and, and when Samuel inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman, a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, and listen to the key words that this man says to him. And they said to him, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. You drop down to verse 11, and you see, it says, Then the woman said, Who shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. Now, now in this passage, it's very interesting. And, and, and some, questions, uh, uh, some questions I want to bring up uh, just to understand what's really taking place here. Now, the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, how is uh, uh, Samuel being, quote unquote, resurrected? Right. There's, there's only a few options that we have here. Right. So 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 if Samuel is 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 we know that Samuel is asleep. We know that Samuel is resting. Right. We know he's not in heaven. We know that uh, in this scene that the enemy uh, Satan isn't calling on Samuel from heaven saying, hey, come down here. Somebody wants to meet with you. We know that's not an option. We know that Satan isn't isn't resurrecting Samuel from the dead in order to speak with Saul, we know that's not the case. We know that Satan doesn't have the power to resurrect, right? And then that only leaves one other option, that this Samuel that's being quote-unquote resurrected is, 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 is Satan himself, is, is, is an evil angel, is a demon resurrecting, speaking to Saul. 
And so when you're thinking about that from the context, I, I, I believe that this is, that there's a principle here that we can actually draw from and, 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 and keep with us uh, through everything that we're facing in life. And the concept is this. Point number two, if you want to write this down, never allow your present circumstances forfeit your paradise. Never let your circumstances forfeit your paradise. Now, there's a lot of things that I, I believe Saul was facing in this time, but one of the biggest things that he was facing in this time was fear. And his fear was causing him to go, instead of, instead of to God, instead of relying upon God, instead of seeking God, it caused him to go in a completely opposite direction. And fear has a way of doing that sometimes. Now, I don't know what it is uh, that might be uh, causing you to forfeit your paradise, but I want to encourage you to remain faithful. I want to encourage you to remain strong. I want to encourage you to stay grounded in the word, to stay grounded seeking God, because there's so many things that constantly comes our way that makes us want to uh, uh, forfeit our paradise or forfeit what God has in store for us. God has blessings and, 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 and all these different things for us. And, and how many times do we forfeit those blessings? How many times do we forfeit uh, uh, our paradise in order for uh, uh, satisfying uh, um, only for a moment our current circumstances? And it happens so many times. And I'm encouraging you, never allow your per present circumstances, never allow what you're going through, never allow what you're dealing with currently in your home, never allow what you're currently dealing with at your job, never allow currently what we're dealing with on a global scale, uh, uh, forfeit your paradise. And that's exactly what Saul did in this story. And there's, 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 there's one more passage that I wanted to go to, and this is kind of all building up to this passage. And I think that this is a, a passage that people maybe have had questions on for a very long time. Uh, and, and they were always curious as to why this was the case. But the, the, the passage is in Psalms chapter 116. Psalms chapter 116. It's in Psalms chapter 116, reading of verse 15. And, and, and this is really when... Uh, this verse um, and this topic of the state of the dead really began, really began to become something beautiful for myself. Um, and, and it says this in Psalms chapter uh, 116, verses 15. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Um, and and I, I, I always, you know, I've heard people wrestle with this. I've wrestled this, with this myself. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of of his saints. And it's like, why is it precious in the sight of the Lord, uh, the death of his saints, right? And I came to realize that the reason why it's precious in the sight of the Lord is because uh, when an individual dies uh, in Christ or when an individual uh, uh, goes to sleep that is a saint, um, they rest until the second coming. They rest until the second coming. The next point that I have for us, and this is really the main point, it's, 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 it's the significance of the state of the dead is this. You have peace waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. You have peace waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. For those uh, that may not un be understanding that, I put it in different words. It says, you have rest while waiting for the fulfillment of of your promise. You have rest while waiting for the fulfillment of your promise, right? So these people, they, 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 they die in Christ or they go to sleep as a saint, right? And then as they are waiting until Christ comes back to resurrect them from the dead, they are resting. And, and, and the way that this influences our day on a daily basis is, is God has given us a promise in his word. And as we claim the promise of that word, we also get to rest, waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. We also get to rest in the reality that God has it under control. We also get to rest in the truth that God is going to handle that business, or God is going to handle my job, or God is going to handle my family. I can rest on these promises until they get fulfilled. And that is what the state of the dead, in a sense, is. It's rest until the promise is fulfilled. And when I began to think about it in that lens, I began to realize how much have I truly been placing on my own self. 
I've been placing uh, the fulfillment of, my pro- of the promise on my own shoulders. And how many of us have been doing the same? And God is encouraging us. God is strengthening us. God is walking with us, and he's telling us, look, look, I'm here so that you can have rest. I'm here so that you can have peace. I'm here so that you can relax and allow me to handle it. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever struggles you may be facing, whether it's on a global scale or whether it's on a personal level, God is like, will you place that in my care? Will you place that in my hands? Will you allow me to take that? And will you rest? Will you sleep, relax? And I'm reminded of, of, of Jesus when he was in the storm with the disciples and he was sleeping. He was relaxing. He was enjoying himself while the whole storm was going on around him. And still, even in the midst of that, he woke up like everything was okay and told the storm, peace be still. And that is the same way that God intends for his children to be. It's the same way that God intends for you to be, that you may be resting, in, 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 resting knowing that God has under the control, knowing that God has made a promise and you're claiming that promise, trusting that he will fulfill it himself. There's one, there's one passage that I, that I want to end with, and it was a passage that uh, I actually recently read um, that spoke to this situation so much. And uh, it's in Psalms chapter 37. It's in Psalms chapter 37. Uh, and it's actually reading in verse 37. Psalms chapter 37, reading in verse 37. Or, sorry, reading in verse 7. Psalms chapter 37, reading verse 7. And, and, and this first part, it just hits. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait and wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord. Uh, I I think this verse is beautiful, uh, especially speaking to the situation, um, because I'm just imagining uh, what it would look like if Christians around the world, if everybody around the world, decided we are going to rest in the Lord and patiently wait on him. What would that look like if everybody, whatever issues we were facing on a global scale, whatever issues we were facing when it comes to our churches, whatever issues we're facing when it comes to our families and our homes, or whatever we're facing when it comes to a personal level, what would it look like if we decided today that we are going to rest in the Lord, that we are going to wait patiently on him, that we are going to claim this promise and patiently wait in a rest period for the fulfillment on the promise, what would that look like? And, and, and I'm confident, I know without a shadow of a doubt, that peace that passes understanding, as soon as we claim that promise, as soon as we grab hold on that promise, and as soon as we enter into that period of saying, like, Lord, it is in your hands. Lord, I trust you. I, as soon as that takes place, I guarantee you that peace that passes understanding will begin to consume your heart. I can guarantee you that anxiety will leave. I can, I can assure you that, that, that frustration, that anger, depression, that fear will begin to leave and peace will begin to consume your heart because in the end, that's what God wants for us. He wants for us to rest in him and wait patiently on him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful because we serve a God who is capable of doing so much. We serve a God who's kind and loving towards us. And just those combinations, a God who's powerful and a God who's loving, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we we can rest. We can rest in the reality that that you will take care. We can rest in the reality that, that you have it under control. We can rest in the truth that you are the one that we can rely upon in every circumstance, in every situation. And Father God, if there's somebody watching right now that wants to rely upon you, I pray that they may surrender. I pray that they may recognize the promise. I pray that they may rest until the fulfillment. I pray that you may take them and use them in a mighty way. Lord, we thank you, and we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise this Sabbath day, and we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you were blessed by the message, and if you have any questions on the message, 
I encourage you to drop it in the comments below and we will do our best to respond to the comments, whether it's by responding to the comments or making a whole video on the questions that you have. Thank you so much once again and God bless.